Friends, today we will move to understanding the role and responsibilities of the Chief Information Commissioner. As you are aware, that information commissions have been established at the central level as well as at various state government levels. And uh, the Chief Information Commissioner is supposed to head the Information Commission. He is empowered to exercise the power of supervision direction and management of the affairs of the information commission and he may exercise all such powers or do all such acts and things which may be exercised by the central information commission the chief is in charge of the information commission he monitors and supervises the various activities of the information commission as well you would notice that the central chief information commissioner is granted a senior status. The reason for granting that senior status is to have a head of the information commission and hence being the head he is interested with all the powers that are required for allocating of cases within the information commissioners, supervising the staff of the information commission and managing the affairs of the information commission as the case may be. You would also notice that the central chief information commissioner uh, will look into the malfunctioning if there are any and he would also be taking responsibility for any remedial measures if need be. The chief is also responsible for the smooth functioning of the information commission and hence you notice that the chief information commissioner under the RTA Act is the head of the information commission he manages and directs the affair of the information commission and he also looks at allocation of role and responsibility among the various information commissioners and the staff that manage the information commission. The chief information commissioner as the case may be and as you are aware of is appointed by the president of India in the case of central information commission and by the governor of the state in the case of state information commission. The job of the Central Information Commissioner is to assist the Commission in disposing of appeals and complaints received under Section 19 and Section 18 of the Act. These are some of the responsibilities that can be identified to the Chief Information Commissioner. Next, let us look at the division of work. The division of work in the Information Commission is something that will be assigned by the Chief Information Commissioner. He may assign such work among the information commissioners and also decide the process within which all the information commissioners will be adhering to. He may reassign such work if necessary. He may constitute and reconstitute divisional benches or special benches of the commission if the requirement is of such nature. And hence the chief actually manages all both administrative as well as the cogent judicial function within the information commission. You will also notice that the central chief information commissioner makes the assistance of any information commissioner in the affairs of the commission in also the process of management and monitoring the supervision of enforcement of the act by public authorities. Hence it would be the duty of the information commissioners to assist the chief in managing the affairs of the commission in looking at enforcement of the RTA Act, in trying to monitor and supervise the functioning of public authorities under the Right to Information Act. Finally, you would notice that the Chief and all other Information Commissioners are there to fulfill the common objectives of the RTA Act and hence it is the duty of all the members of the Commission to actually live up to the spirit and objective of the RTA Act and to achieve the goals stated under this legislation and hence the information commissioners must not have any personal egos or if they do shed them off so that they can make the RTA Act a really successful legislation. It is also important that all of them collectively work together to keep the commission an autonomous independent body which will truly fulfill the purpose and objective behind the enactment of the Right to Information Act. Kindly note, the headquarters of the Information Commission, especially the Central Information Commission, 
is stated to be in Delhi. However, the law also looks at a futuristic vision and it states that in case at any point of time, the work requirement so demands and of course, keeping in view the public convenience that is required, the office of the Central Information Commission may be established at the designated required places. If such requirement arises uh, with the growth of the legislation and it is necessitated to protect the Right to Information Act of the citizens, then the Central Information Commission may have its offices outside New Delhi. However, establishing offices beyond the place of Delhi would require the approval of the central government. However, as of now, the Central Information Commission has not established any such office beyond the capital city of New Delhi. However, this is a possibility as we see in other tribunals. For example, under the National Green Tribunal Act, there are uh, regional uh, benches that are situated uh, in Bombay, sorry, in Pune, in Chennai, in Bhopal and uh, apart from Delhi and uh, one would assume that in other quasi-judicial forums uh, that is uh, uh, for example in the consumer forum you have district consumer forums in every district uh, so that kind of distribution of work if necessitated in other cities can also be something that can be looked into by the central information commission however as of now this has not been necessitated and this has not been implemented as well Oath and affirmation of the information commissions, the commissioners. An oath is very important. This provides for uh, a member of the commission to enter into office. And the oath also is important as it involves the status and responsibility attached to the job of the information commissioner. Whenever a person is appointed to any authority, as such, he is assigned with numerous roles is assigned with the autonomy of functioning and hence it is important to understand, control and monitor those persons who have such role and responsibilities. And hence, while being appointed by the President of India, all information commissioners would take an oath. It would be relevant to check the true dedication and commitment to the job and to actually affirm the sincerity towards the job in the name of God. Therefore, to ensure thus such kind of sincerity and dedication to the job assigned to such person and to ensure self-discipline, normally information commissioners are administered with the necessary oath before they assume the office of the information commission. It is like members of parliament or members of legislative assembly uh, taking a oath before they assume their tenure uh, after elections. You will also notice that the oath to be administered under this section signifies the status and responsibility attached to the members of the Information Commission. So, prior to the amendment in 2019 to the RTA Act, you will notice that the status of the Information Commission was to the level of the Election Commission. However, post-2019, this seems to have been slightly altered and uh, the status of the Information Commission is as good as any other quasi-judicial forum, any quasi-judicial member uh, who occupies office under different administrative as well as quasi-judicial tribunals. So, oath and affirmation are an important integral part of the assumption of office of the Information Commissioner. The next comes of resignation and removal. You will notice that uh, Information Commissioners uh, can uh, resign from their position uh, before their tenure expires. This is something that they can act upon themselves if they wish. They do not uh, want to continue as an information commissioner. In the case of central information commissioners, they have to send their resignation to the president of India. Why? Because the president of India is the appointing authority and hence the resignation must go to the president uh, as well. The normal process of Submitting a resignation is in, to be in writing and uh, uh, it has to be sent to the president and the president uh, would have uh, the subjectivity of accepting the resignation or rejecting the same. You will also notice that uh, resignation uh, is uh, required 
because it is a fixed term or a fixed tenure or till the age of 65 years and hence uh, the office of the information commissioner is uh, something uh, that is left to his convenience or his will and if an information commissioner thinks that it is not convenient for him to continue his office or he is not interested anymore in continuing with the same office there is a possibility of he resigning from that particular job as well. So he is not completely obligated to continue for the tenure as the case may be and uh, he can resign if he wishes to do the same. Salary and allowances of the information commissioners. Kindly note, pre-2019 amendment to the RTI Act, you will notice that the information commissioners were given the same status as the election commission of India or the election uh, commissioner of India. And the salaries on the allowance payable to the chief election commissioner was uh, payable to the information commissioners. Interestingly, most of the terms and conditions of the chief election commissioner were applicable to the chief information commissioner. This was important to bring in the independence, the autonomy, to the functioning of the information commission and to elevate the status of the information commission to a constitutional status which the chief uh, election commissioner usually enjoys. So the election commission and the information commission were given equal status, equal responsibility and equal salary and allowance. However, kindly note, when you speak about the election commission of India, the election commission is equated to the Supreme Court of India and hence the information commissions enjoyed the status of the judges of the apex court. Now this slightly has changed over the 2019 amendment and after the post 2019 amendment there are two most significant changes that have been brought about. First and the foremost the tenure of the information commissioners has been reduced from five years to three years and uh, 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 three years or the age of 65 whichever is earlier. This is uh, in tune because the government justified and said that it is tuned with the appointment of all other uh, quasi judicial members and they wanted to bring the information commission as equal to other judicial uh, 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 authorities uh, and not uh, equated with the constitutional bodies like the Supreme Court and the Election Commission. And hence, this is a very significant change that has been brought about through an RTI Amendment Act of 2019 enacted by the Parliament. You would also notice that the salary of the Chief Information Commissioner is capped at 2.5 lakhs and the salary of the Information Commission is capped at 2.25 lakhs. So this cap uh, in the salary has meant that uh, the status, the salary and the allowance of the Information Commissioners is now equal to the members of other tribunals and not to the Election Commission. That's the slightest change that uh, will have to be attributed to the first ever amendment to the RTI Act in the year 2019. Uh, last but not the least, if you see uh, at the time of appointment, if the information commissioner is in receipt of any pension or disability or wound pension as the case may be. Uh, with his previous employment with the government of India, then such pension would be deducted from the salary as well. This is a normal process for all officers who retire from the government that if they get post retirement appointments, their pension would be adjusted to the new salary or allowance they uh, are slated to receive under their uh, uh, post retirement appointments. So that is normally the case with all appointments and the same is continued to be uh, uh, extended to the information commissions. The supporting staff. The supporting staff is a very essential component of the working of the information commission and uh, you will notice that uh, the information commissioners can go about appointing officials or uh, hiring employees as required for the efficient performance and the functioning of the RTI Act and hence any such assistance that may be required by the information commissions should be granted by the government 
and the government has to make provision for ministerial support to the information commission and hence without such assistance or staff the information commission probably not, cannot function to its full capacity and to the full expectation of citizens vis-a-vis -vis the right to information act and hence providing such assistance is provided in the statute and has legal force so the government is or shall be obligated to provide that supporting staff as the case may be to the information commissions both at the central and the state level you will also notice that the supporting staff can be extended with statutory privileges the reason being that because the act provides for such appointments the act also gives uh, discretion to the information commission to fix the terms and conditions however subject to government approvals you will notice that the staff have certain kinds of statutory recognition as the case uh, is and uh, they are not completely always depending on the discretion of the government this was essential to bring in the autonomy and independence of the information commission and hence uh, supporting staff get their due recognition from the government and the government is supposed to support uh, the appointment of the uh, supporting staff as well what this does is this will ensure that the information commissions are not affected by the change of political power the change of political power often affects the functioning of various quasi judicial bodies because the change of political power in turn uh, replaces the uh, members of the quasi judicial authorities and they are subject to uh, the privileges of appointment of the government to which they actually serve however under the right to information act this is completely secured and you will notice that information commissions are not affected by the change of power either at the state level or at the central level they have been given the sense of autonomy independence not only in the appointment of the information commissioners with fixed tenure and security of tenure but also in the fact of getting supporting staff as the case may be so that there is a mandatory uh, government support to the information commission on a continuous basis this helps the functioning of the commission this helps the smooth uh, 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 you know uh, functioning of uh, the affairs of the information commission and uh, it largely will avoid any kind of public inconvenience in managing the affairs of the information commission and will actually gain lot of public support to how the information commission goes about exercising the various uh, uh, functions including the complaint and the appeal provisions and to look at uh, effective implementation of the right to information act as the matter goes forward you will also note that the state information commissions have similar rights similar powers similar uh, appointment process and also the kind of status and responsibility as the central information commission and hence uh, without repeating the aspect of the state information commissions i think one would uh, just uh, say that it's a dito kind of a, a mechanism for the state information commission and the state information commissioners which means if we read chapter 4 of the right to information act it deals with the powers duties and functions responsibilities of the state information commissioners which is very similar uh, to the central information commission kindly note every state government is empowered to constitute a body for the state information commission and the same has been uh, done by various state governments at the state levels naturally most of the state information commissions are situated in the capital of the state and they function from that part itself right so uh, there is no requirement to additionally deal with all the aspects in terms of uh, appointment uh, uh, removal resignation suspension uh, salaries and allowances of the state information commission because they are very similar to the central information commission and the same has already been discussed in this module next is the aspect of penalties as you are aware of we have discussed the two essential powers and functions exercised by the information commissions first we discussed under section 18 the power to receive complaints second we discussed under section 19 the power of appeal these are two essential powers that are exercised by the information commissions however you will notice that the most effective power 
that the information commissions have is imposing penalties on the public information officer for the violation of the right to information act and that power to impose penalty is stated in section 20 of the RTI act. If one goes by the enactment, one would uh, definitely anticipate that when any legislation is made, the biggest fear for the draftsman is to ensure that violations and non-compliance of the law should be addressed adequately. Now, the Right to Information Act has seen various violations. The Right to Information Act continues to see various non-compliances as the case may be. However, please note the effectiveness of every legislation can only be assessed or tested on the fact that how is the punishment, how is the sanction described. If the sanction and the punishment are those that are uh, designed effectively, then the success of the legislation is possibly ensured. And hence, the threat of punishment for non-compliance is probably one of the important mechanisms for every act to make it either a successful legislation or otherwise. And hence, you will notice that uh, it is important for institutions to pin in responsibility. It is important for institutions to identify violation. It is important for institutions to impose sanction for infringement and non-compliance of the provisions of the law. And hence, Section 20 is an empowering uh, section. It is an empowering section because the statute tends to give the Information Commission the power to impose penalty on such officers who have failed in their duty to protect the right to information. And hence, you will notice that when a citizen has a right to information, he is an information seeker. His right is very important. His right needs adequate recognition, adequate protection. And when you look at the right duty correlation, if a citizen has a right, the state has a duty. Now, the state does not have a face of its own. The duty of the state is represented by the public information officer or such other officers who actually represent the public bodies or the public authorities. Interestingly, for the first time uh, in a, a legislation in India, you find that it is not the vicarious liability that is imposed, which means for the fault of the servant, the master of the government is not held responsible, whereas the officer of the servant himself is held responsible. So he cannot shift that responsibility to the state. He has to take the responsibility for any violations or infringement. And hence, you will notice under section 20 of the RT Act, the penalty is not on the public authority, as is the case in other acts. For example, under the Companies Act, when penalty is imposed, it is on the company. It is not on individual managing directors or directors. However, under Right to Information Act, the penalty for the violation of the Right to Information Act if the duty to protect the information is violated, the officer who is responsible, the officer who represents the public authority shall be penalized. And please note, penalty is a very serious word. It has uh, 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 connotations that do not apply in civil law. It has those connotations that uh, look at uh, a very high uh, imposition of criminal fine. And hence, when penalty is done, you will notice it is the duty of the Information Commission to check before imposition of penalty whether this was done intentionally as against unintentionally, whether this was done deliberately as against, uh, uh, you know, uh, innocently. Was it done willfully as against uh, uh, non-willfully or was it done knowingly? I think when you emphasize the words under section 20, which include in, uh, the word even malafide. So the words intentional, malafide, deliberate, willful or knowing clearly depicts a negligent mind of the officer. It clearly depicts a mind which very clearly states that here is a public information officer who knew what he was supposed to do, but deliberately chose not to do so. It is the duty of the information commissioner to actually check whether a penalty has to be imposed in a particular case or whether uh, some other uh, sanction has to be imposed in that case. However, the mind, the attitude and the intention of the officer is probably the prima facie reason why a penalty under section 20 will probably be enforced. Kindly note, the penalties under section 20 are to be imposed 
for the failure in the performance of the duty of the information uh, officer, the public information officer. And it also clearly depicts the fact that this is something uh, generally imposed in case of knowingly violating the statutory provisions under the Right to Information Act.